Uh, well, uh, today I'm giving some lectures on Diffusion Monte Carlo and uh, basically uh, it's a little confused in the schedule. Um, the, the list of topics is okay, but the order is not okay. So I guess when you look online, it might be uh, a little hard to find things. But um, the main topic is projector Monte Carlo, which we also call diffusion Monte Carlo. And then we're going to talk about some related topics. Uh, I'm just going to touch on them because in the, in the time... Um, that we have, a, we can't go into too much depth, but this is only Wednesday morning, so if you, if you ask a lot of questions, then maybe you'll find out some more of the details uh, later on in the week. Okay, what's wrong? Oh, but maybe should I should take the cell phone out of my pocket? Does that... Yeah. What? <laughs> that would help a lot. Why? Does it make some yeah, interference? Yeah, interference. Okay. <laughs> um, do you want to just get this? See, you're all these other people talking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> things are better now? Okay, good. Okay. Uh, so, Projector Monte Carlo. Uh, the basic idea goes back supposedly to Fermi. Um, there, however, there's no real historical record of Fermi like writing a paper or giving a, writing something down. This is only comes from some of his colleagues, namely famous people like Ulam and, uh, um, and Feynman and so forth, that uh, say that he talked about this, and supposedly back in the 1930s, he even, he, you know, Fermi was the one that discovered a lot of properties of neutrons and neutron reactors. In Chicago, he made the first reactor, and he was concerned with neutrons diffusing around, and, you know, what is the probability that they get out of the reactor? I mean, that's the key pro numerical problem. And so this is very much, you'll see, like Diffusion Monte Carlo. That is, we have uh, our random walkers diffusing around and different things happening to it. So he went, of course, that was in 1930, was well before you had computers. And the question is how he could solve this partial differential equation describing diffusion of neutrons. And so he had the idea, well, instead of solving it, why don't we develop a random walk procedure to solve it? And so it actually just take some representative neutrons and with a roll of a dice or cards or something, you decide what's going to happen to the neutrons, whether they uh, you know, are absorbed or they uh, scatter or they uh, cause some uh, 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 fission or something like that and create more neutrons and sort of a whole, this whole random walk procedure for solving the problem of, of the key problem of a new reactor, that is how, how the neutrons are transported. Um, and then there are some papers around 1950 uh, by this group at Los Alamos, uh, and we'll come to what's called the Feynman-Katz formula. That's one of the, the actual papers. Um, this was the first real application that is not doing, the, these earlier papers were doing problems that you could solve with another method. This is a paper by my advisor, Mal Kalos, and also two uh, uh, relatively well-known French people, uh, Dominique Levesque and Lou Verlet. And uh, using, Kalos developed this method that, I won't describe his method very much because it's quite complicated, but they solved the problem of 256 hard spheres in a periodic box uh, using the uh, projector Monte Carlo method, which he called Green's function Monte Carlo. And so I'll, you could do this uh, with the methods that we're going to talk about today. But that's pretty impressive in 1974 to do 256. I mean, we actually don't do that many more than 256 electrons, even with computers that are maybe 10 to the 8th times more powerful. <laughs> um, so 
Um, so, why, we, why do we want to go beyond variational Monte Carlo? We'll come back to this. Uh, this is just to summarize. What is variational Monte Carlo? That's, I said, the simplest technique. Variational Monte Carlo, you uh, uh, posit a wave function, like a Jastro Slater wave function, and then you calculate averages with that wave function. But in a many-dimensional problem, you don't know if it's really the solution. You just get an upper bound to the energy. You try to get better and better upper bounds, but you don't know. Uh, the, it's powerful because you can use any trial function. The scaling in variational Monte Carlo is, is pretty good. It's almost classical. Uh, it's, you know, it's polynomial. And you learn about wor what works in wave functions. There's no sign problem. Like uh, You heard a little bit about the sign problem yesterday. You'll hear more today. But you know, there's some difficulties. The optimization of the trial function, that's an extra step. And until recently, uh, Jeremy McManus is going to talk about this tomorrow, but about optimization techniques, so I skipped over that. But, you know, it's a time-consuming. Until recently, you couldn't do so many parameters, right? It was kind of, uh, it, it was a very slow, human-intensive step. Um, but more serious, the energy is insensitive to order parameter. What do I mean by this? I will take... Burkhardt introduced the questioning part. What, what do you think this means? Um, the order parameter, we mean, we're talking about phase transitions, right? And the, the uh, you could, it, it's not necessarily a sharp method that tells you which phase you're in. Uh, you, you're not, for example, uh, a liquid solid transition is the simplest order parameter in a continuum system. In a, in a solid, you have long range density fluctuations that go on forever. In a liquid, you don't. You have more of a homogeneous system. You can make wave functions, uh, you know, describing a liquid or a solid, and maybe they look pretty good. And so to calculate the transition, you're not necessarily going to get it at the, the right density. Uh, because you know, the energy, what you really want to look at is the density fluctuations. You don't want to look at um, the energy to decide whether it's liquid or crystal. That's only a secondary thing. And in fact, there's a, a bias that's, I guess, that you should learn about in that in the variational method, it's going to favor simple phases. It's going to, uh, that is, a solid is, is simpler to describe than a liquid. I mean, in fact, for years in science, people couldn't figure out what was a liquid. I mean, we don't have that discussion anymore, but back in the 1950s or 40s or 30s, you know, what was a liquid exactly? How could you have a dense system that didn't have order? We have the same thing with lattice systems. People talk about a spin liquid ground state and you know what is this you know how can you have order but not have order you know so that's what a liquid is and until, until you know people had simulations there kind of a lot of question about what is a liquid you know because uh, you have obviously a lot of short range order but not long range order and so a wave function for a liquid is not as good as a wave function for a solid so uh, when you're Calculating where the transition is, it's going to always favor the solid phase and it's going to make the transition happen too quickly into the solid. Um, of course, then the other problem is it's difficult variationally to find out how accurate the answers are. Uh, you know, you, ha you have an upper bound, but unless somebody tells you what the exact answer is, how far away are you from that exact answer? And Generally speaking, the problem is what goes into the trial function comes out. There used to be a saying in computer science, "Gigo, garbage in, garbage out, right? That's basically variational. You're assuming a type of a wave function, uh, and, you know, that's the wave function you get. It doesn't mean that the true solution is that wave function. Uh, so, Projector Monte Carlo relieves some of these problems, not completely, but it makes it more automatic. It's actually, 
example where you could change just a little bit in the algorithm and you make it much more automatic, right? It's not like, uh, it's actually less work to change from variational to, to projector Monte Carlo than it is, say, to go to a more advanced wave function because that's more programming. Okay. Diffusion Monte Carlo is a is a, a type of projector Monte Carlo. I'll come back to the general definition, but the basic idea is you take a trial wave function. Notice the R, remember, is our coordinates. And it could include spin, I suppose. Uh, the, the coordinates, all the coordinates of the electrons. And the second argument is going to be called time, but it's really imaginary time, as we learned about yesterday. Uh, it's not real time. So you take your initial wave function, your initial guess, and you use the Hamiltonian or the density matrix operator, this operator e to the minus h times t, uh, to generate a wave function uh, at a later time. I say time like this, you know, imaginary time. Uh, and so how do we analyze that? And I also slipped in a reference energy, it's called the trial energy, and you'll see down here why we do that. Uh, but you know, in physics, you can always change the reference energy, uh, the zero of energy. So this is just a number. Okay, so how do you analyze the effect of an exponential operator? This is an operator, a mini-body operator in the three-dimensional space, in the Hilbert space. Well, what you do, uh, if you remember your linear algebra or your quantum mechanics, is you, it, you theoretically diagonalize this Hamiltonian and get the exact energies and eigenfunctions. Those are the energies. Alpha is the state. This is a complete set of states. All the way, solutions of this time-independent Schrodinger equation. And now we can find exactly the effect of this operator. Namely, this is the result. The, the uh, wave function at time t is given by the sum over the I, all the exact eigenfunctions, the exact eigenfunctions, this time dependence, and then this coefficient. Okay, now, but, of course, uh, the point of all this is to go to large time. In large time, there's, if it's non-degenerate, there's going to be a single state that dominates this, for you, those, you know, and in mathematics, this is like a, a Kirillov sequence. You generate by applying the Hamiltonian many times, you generate uh, a lower energy state, or it's like Lanchos in the exact diagonalization. And so you get the ground state wave function at large time, and then you get a number here, which is the strength of the ground state. And this is where the trial energy comes in. This is the ground state energy, E0, the exact ground state energy, and this is our trial energy. And you see, to keep the normalization of the wave function fixed, we must adjust the trial energy to the ground state energy. Of course, in the beginning, we don't know what the ground state energy is. But this is, we put some feedback in our algorithm. So as we're going along, we keep track of the normalization, and uh, we uh, adjust the trial energy to keep the normalization fixed at large time. And this is, in fact, one way of determining the ground state energy. The ground state energy is the thing that keeps the normalization fixed. I'll show you an example in a little while. And then there's another term in the constant. It's just a constant. And this is the overlap between the exact wave function and the trial wave function. Phi is the exact mini-body wave function in psi is the uh, trial function, that is your slater jester wave function or whatever. So this is a number, and so, you know, there's always a caveat that the projector Monte Carlo gives you the lowest energy state that overlaps with your trial function. But if you're doing something like a boson problem, it's pretty hard not to get the, some uh, overlap with the ground state. Uh, as well, I can explain to you, but it, this is, it's pretty easy to keep this non-zero, right? 
to have some uh, overlap with the ground state. So this is the basic idea of projector. We use the Hamiltonian to project out the ground state. Um, let's see. Uh, I forgot what I was going to say. Um, so now we want to interpret this, uh, how to do this on the computer. Of course, uh, this would be, you know, how in the world are you ever going to do that? Oh, what I was going to say is that this should not look unfamiliar from yesterday. This is the same thing as the density matrix that Burkhardt Militzer was talking about. Uh, but we're just applying it in a slightly different way. We're using the same operator, but uh, we're going to do the Trotter breakup, like he talked about. But what's different? The difference is the initial conditions. We're going to use the trial wave function for the initial conditions. And we're going to represent the, the system differently. We're going to turn it around, and I'll show you. Um, but basically, the idea of the projector is quite, uh, as t goes to infinity, remember in uh, the density matrix, who we call that beta instead of t, and beta is 1 over kt. So my t goes to 0 in path integrals would mean the temperature, I'm sorry, my t goes to infinity means the temperature goes to 0. But the idea of projector Monte Carlo, though, is you don't start out at infinite temperature and project down to 0 temperature. You start out with your trial wave function, which you already hope is close to the ground state. So you don't have to go as far. You don't want to have to go all the way from a billion degrees Kelvin down to zero. You start out with your trial function, which is already at a, effectively a low temperature. Yeah? Where do you get the relation between the time and temperature? Well, that's in the Boltzmann distribution. Are you familiar with the Boltzmann distribution? The question was, how do I get the relationship between the time and temperature? So the, the Boltzmann distribution is e to the minus be, beta times e, or e to the minus energy over kt. And then when we do it in quantum mechanics, we change this to e to the minus beta h, a Hamiltonian, or e to the minus beta h, uh, h over kt. This is the quantum mechanical density matrix operator. That's what you use to, in quantum statistical mechanics to find out what the probability of a given state is or anything in thermodynamic equilibrium. So you see this. All I'm doing is changing the symbol from beta to t. It's, that's a relationship between temperature and time. But real time, at the very end today, I'll talk about uh, excited states and a little bit about time, but real time, the thing that's confusing is e to the t h uh, in the units where h bar equals 1. This is real time in quantum mechanics, that is the time that we're used to on our watch, right? I'm talking here, this, I'm calling this time, but you know, it is along the imaginary axis, so we can look on the complex plane, and this is t, this is real time. But when we do thermodynamics, we work on this axis, the complex, the imaginary axis. So we like to do Monte Carlo simulations up here. We would love to do Monte Carlo simulations along this axis, but it's, it seems to be impossible. It, it's numerically much more difficult to do things here. This is would be, if you take a quantum system, like you heard, of, everybody heard about this collider in, in Switzerland that found the Higgs boson, where they're smashing two quantum objects together and getting out quantum things coming out. That's real time. And that's very difficult to do with Monte Carlo methods. It's another lecture. That's here, this axis. So what, at the very end of the lecture today, I'll talk a little bit about this transformation here from the imaginary axis 
of the projector Monte Carlo to the real axis. You mean wick rotation? Yeah, wick rotation is what you call it sometimes. Yeah? Yeah, that's right. Well, you're asking me about the oscillations in real time. Okay, uh, I believe the question was that uh, uh, Burkhardt mentioned yesterday the trouble with this real axis is that this operator is oscillating, describes waves. You know, the solution is cosine and sines and so forth, the oscillations, positive and negative. Uh, but uh, he was mentioning that, well, if at very large times, all these oscillations should die down and, you know, you should, maybe it's easier. Well, that could be, but the thing is how to use that information. I think that's what's difficult. It's actually possible to do things at short time. And it's also possible to do things at low frequency, but it's hard to combine things and do things at all times and all frequencies. There are certain regimes where it's possible to do things. But, you know, that sounds like a discussion topic. I can't, I want to, I do want to get on to Diffusion Monte Carlo. Well, we haven't gotten to, the, you'll get to that. What was the, mean, what was the meaning of the branching operator? Okay. Um, here, you often hear, hear about Green's function, Monte Carlo. So we want to talk about the Green's function. And so, effectively, this is the equation that we're, we're trying to solve, see? Well, okay. So if we take the time derivative of this equation, you pull down a, a Hamiltonian. Okay, so this is what's called a block equation. Um, uh, and this is the uh, so-called density matrix. You see, this is the solution to this equation. So these are equivalent. If, and you can define, this is actually the uh, relation with uh, path integrals. We call this the Green's function and projector Monte Carlo, but this is really the same as the density matrix. And, you know, these are various relations. I, I showed this in the previous view graph. And this is the boundary condition on the Green's function. So uh, this is sort of the fundamentals of how you do diffusion Monte Carlo. You say, if you have your system at a given point in configuration space, then how does it move? And it moves by the Green's function. So this, this initial condition at t equals 0 says that the particle has to be at position R0. This is a, delta fun a, a three-dimensional delta function. And this is how, how it evolves in time. So how do we interpret this as a Monte Carlo process? Um, again, here is the, the block equation. This is the, if I take the time, time derivative of that uh, evolution equation, the operator equation, I get this equation. Okay, and the, this is like a master equation in statistical mechanics. It says how things change in time. And we're particularly going to work with Hamiltonians, the non-relativistic Hamiltonian. I think as maybe people ask, you can't, you can't, uh, often these methods will break down if you try a different Hamiltonian. So we're going to limit ourselves, but this includes electronic structure, uh, you know, where V of R is a Coulomb potential. But this is the non-relativistic kinetic energy operator. Now, just uh, speaking just uh, very simply, Trotter's formula says when you have an evolution, we have three terms here on the right-hand side. We have this del squared term, we have the potential term, and then we have this constant. Okay, so we can, Trotter's formula in terms of differential equations say if you work at small enough time steps, you can consider these two equations independently of each other. You can break it down. This is actually the same as you do with molecular dynamics, if those of you do molecular dynamics, where 
you know, you do an evolution, you assume that the force is constant for a certain period of time, and then you update the force, and you proceed. Here, so we have to consider these two equations separately, and what do they tell us? If we interpret it as a probability equation, let's interpret the wave function as a probability. I know this is going to cause difficulty in most cases because the wave function is a, a complex number, and how do you interpret it as a probability? For the moment, let's consider we're doing a bosonic system, and we can say that it's a probability. Okay, what is this equation? This equation is diffusion. That's where we get the name diffusion Monte Carlo. This says, this is called Fick's Law in chemistry, but it says that uh, the, uh, the, the, the solution of this is a Gaussian, as I'll show you, of this equation is a Gaussian. If it starts out at, at the delta function initial condition, things move around in a diffusion process, right? So that's easy to simulate on a computer. You just have a random walk. Now about this equation, well, this is a, a reaction equation, like a nuclear reaction. Uh, the change in probability is given by a constant times the probability. So the solution is an exponential. So if this is um, positive, then it's a decay process. If it's negative, it's a growth process. So maybe, it, maybe a better analogy would be to bacteria in a pond. So I'll uh, get rid of the drunkard's walk, and I'll imagine we have a lake. And bacteria, they don't swim. They just diffuse around randomly, or bugs or something in a lake. OK, that's this equation. This equation would say there's certain places in the lake where the bacteria grow, and there's certain places where they die. Maybe certain places there's poison or it's too hot, and there's certain places where there's food and they branch. So if, you, if they didn't move around, you would solve the problem by saying that they grow or they die off, and that would be this equation. R is the location in the lake, but if you have this term, then they diffuse around. So when you have both terms in this equation, you have both processes. That's what Trotter's formula means. That means the bacteria in one time step, you decide whether they grow or shrink, and the next time step, you, they do a random walk for one step. And then they move someplace differently where the growth conditions are different and something different happens. So, so that's the interpretation of branching, is the probability, didn't, the probability in this equation, remember, we, it interprets uh, the uh, uh, psi is a probability. And so if we integrate this over position, you see that the total probability is not conserved. That's the branching process. There could be more bacteria or less than there were at the current time. So it's a brand, what we call a branching process. And, well, this is formally uh, how you do it. Uh, how do you solve this equation? Well, this is the formal solution. And this is Trotter's formula right here that Burkhardt introduced yesterday. All right? And the limit as n goes to infinity. Now, if we write this thing out, and then this is just like path integrals, uh, we write out this operator and we expand it out into this random walk, R0, R1 prime, R1 prime, R1, R up to n, n steps, right? We have to figure out how A and B operate, uh, you know, what is the density matrix for A and B separately, and that's what I just did in words. And so, in fact, these are the, the answers. This is the kinetic density matrix is just a Gaussian uh, that the particles uh, move in a random walk with a Gaussian. And the smaller the time step is, the smaller the Gaussian is. 
Uh, and then this is the potential operator. And basically, that doesn't move the particles. They stay at the same place. But the size, of the number of bacteria or the number of walkers changes depending on the potential energy at that point. And this is in reference to the trial energy. So this is like your, coming back to the analogy of the bacteria in the pond, you have to adjust the level of fertilizer or whatever in the pond to keep the bacteria constant. That's the trial energy. I mean, you know, it could be that all the bacteria die out, or it could be that they have an exponential growth and, you know, they completely destroy the lake, right? Uh, either is possible, but to, what we're interested in is the steady state solution where there's a finite population, not zero or infinity. Your reference is constant all the time? I, I'll get to that in a minute, the trial energy. Okay. And as uh, Burkhardt said that there is a time step error in doing it this way, and that's because there's a commutator between T and V. In this analogy, it's easy to understand. Uh, you know, you take a diffusion with step tau, and the potential energy is changing. This is assumes the potential energy is fixed, and when you take a diffusion, it changes. So you have to take a small enough time step that the potential doesn't change very much between one diffusion step and the next. That's what the commutator is all about, right? It would matter, for example, if you did the diffusion first and the potential for, or the potential first. If you change the order, things would change a little bit. So, but Trotter's formula guarantees that if, it, as you take the tau smaller and smaller and smaller, eventually you get the exact answer. Even when you do an infinite number of steps, right? It's a question of limits. So uh, I was wondering if this is going to be strong enough to, can you see that? Well, maybe in the back you can't. Well, the people in the front, at least you can see it. Uh, sorry I couldn't make this darker, but um, this is a harmonic oscillator. And this is an actual simulation of a harmonic oscillator. Actual simulations don't look as pretty as ones that you might draw by hand. But so the ground state, of course, a harmonic oscillator goes, the wave function is this Gaussian here. You have to look this way. Wave function is this Gaussian, okay, and so it's sort of confined between two and minus two here, the particles. So I started out 50 particles, uh, sort of randomly between four and minus four, and this is how they, this is how a bacteria on a line, a single line, evolved. And these terribly looking things are actually a random walk. You know, a random walk is a fractal object, and that's what these things are. These are random walks. But these random walks can die. And so the bugs, so all the fertilizer, if you like, was here at the bottom of the well. And up here, you know, they die out. Uh, so you see that this random walk died, this one died, this one died. But the ones in the bottom of the well keep alive. And they, they, they proliferate, they branch, they create new random walks. You can't see that very well because they're, um, they're hidden by, on top of each other, but there are random walks being created. This is the population, and so the population started out as 50, and then it sort of decreased to about 15 or so, and it fluctuates, and we'll get to how to control this. But actually, the trial energy was set to be the ground state energy, so asymptotically, mathematically, this will start out at a number and it'll decrease and then it'll be absolutely stable if you're doing it mathematically. But on the computer, because you have a finite population, you always get these fluctuations and we'll see how to control that in just a minute. So um, here then is a, is a recap. I have a few different recaps. So uh, we construct an ensemble and we call these walkers. And that example, we had only one variable, but in general, you have three n variables. An r is a three n, and then we have a population of size p. That's how many walkers. You can see how this is going to parallelize, right? You can put them on different processors. Okay. You go through the ensemble and you diffuse each one, a time step tau, 
And how do you do that? You add a Gaussian random number. Um, and this is the size of the Gaussian. And so if the time step is very small, you know, they don't move very far each step. And then this is the diffusion step, and then you have a branching step. How do we do the branching? Well, this is the best thing to do. You calculate the potential energy at the place where you are, that's V of R, relative to the trial energy. And you calculate this exponential part. This is the solution to the, the branching equation. So you're going to end up with a real number between zero and infinity, right? A positive number. You have to convert that to an integer. And what you do is you use the floor function on a computer. That is, you, you add a random number between zero and one, and you truncate it. So if you get a number like uh, 3.9, you throw away the 0.9, and you have three copies. If you have a number like 0.6, truncate it to zero, it's dead. That walk is gone. That's the branching process very simply. That's what this line means, is you truncate. The, you throw away the fractional part. Why does this work? Does anybody have an idea? You're still awake? awake? <laughs> well, it's all probability theory. The average, you have a random number here. So what are the average number of copies that you make? Well, just imagine you sample a lot of different U's. On the average, the number of copies that you make is given by this exponential part. So if you averaged over U, so the, on the average, you would, what you're trying to do is make a, a game on a computer which solves that differential equation, partial differential equation, which leads to the projection of the random walk. So on the average, you're making the right, you're sampling the Green's function correctly. OK. The trial energy is adjusted to keep the population fixed. And this is one equation that you use. Namely, the ground state energy is given by the average potential energy. That makes sense. If V of R on the average equals E of T, then this will be, on the average, 0. This will be 1. And on the average, you'll make one copy. So you can actually prove that that's correct, that the ground state energy is the average potential energy. That sounds very bizarre, and we'll get to that in a minute. You might ask, what happened to the kinetic energy? Well, in this version, without important sampling, we, uh, uh, the kinetic energy is in the diffusion process, but it's not in the estimator of the energy. Uh, I think I'll skip over. You can look in the notes and how you actually sample a Gaussian. This tells you how you do that. Uh, okay, now getting to control, controlling the trial energy. Going back to my graph here, this is the population. With, I started out with 50. This decrease, what does that do to? What did we call that on Monday? That was the equilibration or the warm-up part, right? That's because when I started them out like this, you know, I, I had too many out here in the wings, and they'd all died out. And, you know, after a few steps, they were gone, right? But this part is what we're concerned about. I use the exactly the correct trial energy, but it still fluctuates. Why? Well, that's randomness, fluctuations. But the point is that it's a neutral equilibrium. Like uh, we talk about stability of things. You know that if I roll a ball on a table, well, this isn't a ball, but uh, it's neutral equilibrium, right? There's nothing that says where the minimum is. And that's the same with the population. This is a Markov process, actually. And there's nothing to control the population, and it will just ra randomly go up and down, which is not satisfactory for, from the point of view of your computer, right? So you want to control it. And that's called population control and bias. And basically, the idea, there's different ways of doing it. Uh, this, I'm only going to present one of the ways. Um, but basically, 
we have the idea of a target population. How, how big would you like the population to be? Say it's a thousand walkers. That's the typical number. Um, the, uh, the, so at, at a given stage, say you have, instead of a thousand, say you have 500 walkers. Well, that's too few, right? You would like to be a thousand. That was your target. So what you do is you adjust the trial energy. In this case, you make the trial energy higher, and then what effect will that have? Well, it's easy to work out that the effect will be to boost the population by this amount, much. So delta ET is how much you change the population to give feedback and say, you want, so this P of T is the current population, and you want the current population to return to the target population, P0, after a time, capital T. That's what this equation is. Now we solve for delta ET. We solve this equation. Of course, just take the logarithm, and we say delta ET is um, the logarithm of the current population divided by the, uh, the uh, target population dividing the logarithm by the number of generations you want to restore uh, the target to. And this tells you how to adjust it. So in other words, the trial energy now, putting this into the trial energy, I added this term down here, and I changed the capital T to a kappa, just changed notation. Uh, and so this is how you adjust the trial energy. Um, and Kappa is just a control parameter. Uh, so that's your, your knob, right? And um, so basically, if the population blows up, say P is huge, much bigger than you want it to be, then um, I may have gotten a sign of this wrong, but anyway, uh, the, uh, th this will be a positive number, and you'll raise. Uh, the energy, uh, so I say, well, I, unfortunately, kappa has to be negative here, but anyway, that, that will cause the trial energy to drop down, and that will cause more things to get killed off, and then that will restore the population. So just like if any feedback, that is, you see what's going wrong, and then you adjust things so that they come back into control, and then you have another fluctuation, you adjust it again. But in kappa is a control parameter um, that um, you want to make as small as possible because if you make it too big, then um, uh, you'll introduce a bias. Um, that it's, and so you don't want to tie, have too tight of control. So you want your population, say I said 1,000. My general rule is you, you can have it fluctuate like 20, 30%, no problem. And so you sort of adjust kappa to see 20 or 30 percent fluctuations in your population. And the bigger your population is, the less you have to adjust it. It goes as the square root of p, right? This is all just probability theory uh, applied to this problem. And, you know, if you have no fluctuations in the pop in population, you can show that this is equivalent to variational Monte Carlo then. So if you have too tight control, you return to variational Monte Carlo because then you have no branching. And if you have no branching, this is like variational Monte Carlo. So anyway, so that's why you don't want to have too tight a population control. And nowadays with computers so much larger, then you, know, you could do a population of like 10 to the fourth, 10 to the fifth, and the bias is really quite small of this feedback. That's right. Uh, in principle, he asked uh, it, whether ET should be the exact ground state energy. Yeah, and your question? So my point is that um, before when you uh, when start of the calculation, if you have a very good estimate of ET by some yes. you know, uh -huh. calculation, why don't you just keep it fixed at that level because that's your best estimate for the ground state. Well, that was the example. The question is, why don't you just use the exact value for ET? And that, that was the point of this uh, 
this example here, if you use the exact, va this, the exact value was used for the harmonic oscillator, you still get, it, it's, it's a neutral equilibrium. That is, mathematically, if you had an infinite population, this would be a flat curve. But you get fluctuations in this curve, and eventually the fluctuations will kill you if you don't have feedback, even if you have the exact answer. It's not a question of not knowing what the, the ground state energy is. It's a question of statistics. It, it's uh, it's like, imagine the bacteria in the pond, you know. Uh, you just have an unlucky day and they all die and that's it, right? Uh, uh, it's just the fluctuations. You, you just had a, you, you're doing things like, you know, this, uh, this branching process that I described here. You just pick a whole sequence of U's that were unlucky and it killed everybody off. You know, there's always a possibility. So you have to have a, you have to have, um, a feedback mechanism when that happens to restore it back to where it started. It's like you have to intervene if you're a farmer with your animals so that <laughs> they, they do what you want. So, so and that is, this is happening because of finite number of... Well, it's, it happens because it's a square root of population effect. Yes, that's right. If P were infinite, this wouldn't happen, of course. But the fluctuations go as the square root of the population. More questions? How do you think the initial value for ET? How do I what? Oh, how do we fix the initial value for the trial energy? Well, that's very easy. We run a variational Monte Carlo calculation, and we use the variational value for the trial function. And there's other things more sophisticated you could do, but that's the simple answer. And there was another question here. Yeah? Uh, so here we have a, a ground state energy from the eventually time-evolved wave function. But is the ET that we've adjusted with the population bias a good estimator of the actual ground state energy? Uh, the question is whether the ET that you get from adjusting the population is a good estimator, and yes, it is a good estimator of the population. This is what's called a generational estimator, but usually we use the average value of the potential energy is a little bit better. But you could do that one also, and, and actually at small time steps they're equivalent. Uh, yes, one more question. Well, uh, um, the question is, if you take a bigger and bigger population, you don't have to worry about the fluctuations. So why don't we just do that strategy of, of uh, instead of doing feedback, just take a larger and larger population? That's the question? Well, um, this is a question of limits. You know, that's always... A, that's always a delicate matter of, of the of limits. Is it better? You, you have, if you take a bigger population, that means your evolution in imaginary time is smaller. And that's a bias too. So you have two biases. You're trying to converge down to the ground state. And that's going to take a certain amount of, of iterations, just like in my graph here, right? That effect was this. If instead of doing, that took about, and then I have to average. So it would have been okay. I could have gotten a reasonable answer if I just averaged between one and two here. That's fine. But suppose instead I had a population of 50, I had a population of a million, then the same amount of computer time I would have been stuck over here. So the question is, it's better to do feedback, you know, and then get out here where there's no bias. So you have two biases. One is how fast you get at the equilibrium, and the other is this population. Actually, the population bias is much smaller than this bias. So generally speaking, you always want to do the feedback. You, don't, you always want your computer code to be robust. 
And if you don't do any bias, then you have the possibility that you, you put, you know, you test it out for, say, an hour run and it works fine. And then you put a run that's going to run for a week. And then after, you go away on vacation for a week. But after three days, your population dies out and it's gone. You come back from vacation and, oh, I screwed up. You know, it's, I, I didn't finish. You always want your code <laughs> not to have that possibility of failing, right? Yeah? That's right. It, I, I, I was going to say that, but it's, um, if you look at the log of the population, it's doing a drunkard's walk in minus infinity to infinity. And sooner or later, it's going to get close to minus infinity or plus infinity, and either one is a disaster for your code. There's nothing that constrains it to be a particular population because it's a Markov process. Until you put in feedback, and then it's, uh, yeah. Uh, you don't have to keep the, this feedback interval the same during the whole simulation. The question is whether you have to keep the feedback the same, and that's, that's perfectly correct. You don't have to be, you don't have to keep it the same. You can adjust it dynamically to some extent. That's right, the kappa. You can, uh, yeah. yeah. There's, there's other procedures, so what actually a lot of people like better let me give you the other one. It's called the comb procedure, and that's to say uh, you just do the branching so that you always have exactly the same number of walkers every single step. And uh, that's good for parallel computing because you have a lot of processors. That means every step you would have the same amount of work to do. Uh, but, you know, it's there, okay, there's some debate about which is better. I, I mean, I think this procedure is simpler and better, but... It's more sophisticated. It's not that you don't have branching. I, I could use my animal analogy again, but it's like, uh, suppose you uh, have a sheep farm or something like this. You know, every year you have nuts and a bunch of little sheep or whatever, and uh, it's, you decide at the end of the year, you're gonna, next year you're going to have the same number of sheep as last year, so you have to kill off a bunch of them, right? And so, but you decide which ones to kill off based on which ones you like better, right? So it's like that with the, with the comb method. You just, you, you have a branching factor for all the different walkers. Some of them say 2.2, some of them say 0.6 or whatever, and then you make a, a global decision about which ones to kill off with those probabilities such that you have exactly P0 population at the end. Now, the problem is that that involves some communication on the parallel computer. It may be a trivial amount, but it is a, a par you know, it's a, uh, what you call blocking step in the random walk. So everything has to stop at that point while you decide what the branching factors are going to be. Whereas the algorithm I just, I gave doesn't require any blocking. It's totally, uh, I, you, you have to feed back things, averages, globally, but you don't have to wait for decisions. Um, I got a lot of questions, but okay, go ahead. One more? That's right. Then the VT is kind of very structured. Yes. And maybe it's stable, right? Yes. How to determine the, the starting for everything? Okay. How, how to throw away the first one? Okay, well, um, the question, as I understand it, uh, we estimate the ground state energy, as I said, by averaging the potential energy. And as I was showed, well, I'm going the wrong way. I'm sorry, I probably can't see this, but you know, there is a warm up part. And how do you decide you're going to cut things off here? Well, how do you decide the equilibration? This is always a problem in simulations, is how do you throw away things? 
Uh, it's actually not that difficult to do um, because in diffusion Monte Carlo, particularly in electronic structure, the, the convergence is very rapid. And it's usually a physical scale. In this case, a harmonic oscillator. Why is it one? Well, that's because we're using harmonic oscillator units, and the omega is on the order of one. And so that's the typical energy scale. One is how long it takes for a random walk to diffuse from one point to another in the harmonic oscillator. So convergence is going to be on the order of one in these units. And so what I would say is you, you study a curve like this and you try to understand why it's converging at this rate. In this case, I just gave you the understanding one. Throw away five times that much out to here and run 10 times longer. That is, you, that's a conservative recipe. You do not, what you do not do is sit here and decide right there, I'm going to cut it off. What you do is you make a general rule and then you multiply by five. And you, okay, if you're just looking for qualitative results, um, you could throw away, you could be le more risky. But if you want to be safe, that you do what I say, you, you, you be, you know, you throw away too much. And usually, you know, things converge very fast. So when you're doing electronic structure, the natural scale is one atomic unit. And usually you want to throw away, say, five or ten atomic units of time. And that's good enough. Things usually converge pretty fast. But I can't make a general answer because you can easily construct an example which would be much worse. But, <laughs> but generally, you have better wave functions, you converge just faster. Let's see. Oh, so the next step, uh, let's see. We're already at 52 minutes here. Okay, so uh, important sampling. Uh, this is uh, uh, something that Kalos introduced in the 70s, and I was his graduate student, and, and I took it over to, to the Diffusion Monte Carlo, which is the uh, the, the form that we're going through today. Um, and what does important sampling mean? I'll give you Kalos' definition. Important sampling means you change the probability distribution you're sampling in order to improve the statistical process. You ask what probability distribution should you sample? Remember, we started out saying we're going to sample the wave function. But you could ask, well, why the wave function? Why not the square of the wave function? And you know, this is what Kalos determined, that the best thing to sample in this formalism is this product, f. Phi is the unknown wave function, and psi is your trial wave function, your best guess to the trial wave function. So in other words, you have from variational Monte Carlo or from density functional theory, an idea of what the ground state should look like. You use that information to improve the statistical process. We're not changing the solution at all. We're changing the variance, the fluctuations by this process. That's what the idea of important sampling is. You're not changing the answer. You're reducing the error bar. You're increasing the efficiency, right? So in other words, we still want to use um, this equation here, the same equation. We just multiply this equation. I guess I changed notations. But we multiply it by the trial wave function, this equation. So we're not changing it. We're just multiplying an equation by a function. OK, and so. What, how do we write down the new evolution equation? So you see, all I did was substitute. I, I multiplied this, the equation by psi t, and then I got rid of phi and replaced it by f. So it's exactly the same equation, right? And now I do a step 
where I commute the trial wave function through H. Again, that doesn't change the mathematics. It's just an, an algebraic operation, right? You commute SIT through there, and I regroup the terms. And this is what's called diffusion Monte Carlo, actually, this, this equation. Okay, so we have uh, three types of terms here. And again, this is the same random walk. It's just that we've changed where our bacteria live in the space, uh, but we're, it's the same process. It's actually, Kalos worked in the nuclear uh, engineering community, and the idea was to try to figure out, if you're standing outside a nuclear reactor, how many neutrons hit you, right? How many escape from the reactor? Uh, and the idea is not just to do simulations of the neutrons, but actually to use important sampling. So you particularly figure out those neutrons that are going to come outside. And that's where the idea of important sampling came. Yeah? Yeah, so if your trial function has a node, doesn't that mean that... Okay, we're not doing nodes yet. I know, but if it did... That's I mean, right. Because then, unless it's in the right place, you're now impossible to get the right answer. Well, not mathematically. The question is, if it has a node, you can't get the right answer. But it's not mathematically speaking true. It's how you handle the singularities that's the question. You could handle them correctly. If you don't do anything, if you just ignore the problem, you might get the wrong answer on a computer. But you know, right now, we're just doing a mathematical operation, and there's a proper thing to do if the trial wave function vanishes. Right? You have to interpret the uh, singularity correctly. But for the moment, we're going to deal with psi t as being, uh, having one sign, positive or negative. Um, okay, so we have three types of terms here. We have this term, which was the same as we had before. That's a diffusion term. This term, if you remember back to Monday, this is called the local energy. And it's a constant, I mean, sorry, it's a scalar. That is, it's not an operator. This is just a function. And this is replacing the potential energy. So this is the branching term still. But now you see the branching has been controlled. It's no longer the potential energy. It's the error in your trial wave function. So if you get a better and better trial function, your branching is much less. And that's the advantage of important sampling. But of course, since we change this term, we got a new term that has to compensate. This is the so-called drift term. So F is the probability here, and this is the gradient of the log of the trial function, and this is like a force. You know, if you take the gradient of the Boltzmann distribution, you get the force, classically. So this is a what's called a quantum force, and I guess I have a slide that explains why we call it drift. So what's, if we have, what is the Green's function for this operator here? You see, this is the same as what I just showed you. We have gradient, and then we have this thing is a F, capital F of R, the force, times F is the, um, is the probability distribution. So we want to find the Green's function for this operator here. Well, if you remember down back to freshman physics, um, you can say that in, in terms of a wave equation, this is the solution you can do. Just translate a function. This, this, this is like a momentum operator. It just translates a function a distance, right? And so um, if you have this equation, the solution is this, right, a traveling wave. So the operator just causes the probability distribution to drift in the direction of the force. Um, so Trotter's theorem or formula still applies, except now we have three terms. And so now this is our algorithm. To the pure diffusion algorithm, we've added a drift step that pushes the random walk in directions of increasing trial function. So we have this step where this is the force 
of the coming by the trial function. So if you have no trial function, you have no force, and you resort back to the previous step. So branching is controlled by the local energy, so the fluctuations are controlled if you have a good wave function. Uh, cusp condition can eliminate the infinities, say it, Say you have a hydrogen atom, you have a proton and an electron. So, you know, the potential energy goes like minus 1 over R near the, when the electron goes into the proton. But now if you have a wave function which has the, that cusp condition correct, the local energy doesn't do anything crazy anymore. That's actually, I told you there were some projector Monte Carlo calculations in 1950 using this kind of formalism. No important sampling and they could not do the hydrogen atom back then because of these fluctuations. You have to do something like cut off the potential at small r in order to do it correctly. But as soon as you do important sampling, well, you just put in the correct hydrogen atom wave function and you can do a hydrogen atom, right? It's, uh, of course, it's, you know the solution. Uh, this is now how we determine trial energy. We want to keep the population stable but now the ground state energy uh, is uh, given by this, you can show this is the population, is given by the local energy averaged. And so now your estimate of the ground state energy is much more precise. Now I have a few more slides. Uh, maybe I'll come back. Well, okay, I guess I should do this. Um, we added this so-called accept-reject step in uh, Diffusion Monte Carlo, and let me explain it. The idea is basically is to eliminate some of the time step error. This makes the algorithm much more stable. Um, this is the Green's function with important sampling. This is the density matrix uh, that we started with, the projector de density matrix. And to that, when you do important sampling, you multiply and divide by the trial wave function. So that's where this factor came from. Okay. Now, this is symmetric in R and R prime because H is Hermitian. So you can ask, you can ask about detail balance. Remember detail balance in a Markov chain? What is the probability of going from R to R prime versus R prime to R? And this is the relationship. You can show just from here that this holds, right? That this property holds. So this is the sampling. This is the uh, random walk going from R to R prime, important sampled, and the reverse direction. So we had the idea of uh, doing a metropolis step in diffusion Monte Carlo using this Detail, to enforce the detail balance. If you had the exact Green's function, this would be true. But once you make a Trotter breakup, that is, do a diffusion drift separately, it's not quite true. So let's just enforce it, because we know with our approximations what this is. So we enforce this, and this is the acceptance probability that we should use in Metropolis in order to get this relation. So this. The, the way I view it is this is like energy conservation in molecular dynamics. We want to enforce energy conservation or we want to enforce um, symplectic algorithm. Um, and so we enforce this detail balance property. And um, this is just like variational Monte Carlo, but it has a different twist to it. In variational Monte Carlo, you decide how far you move based on the acceptance probability. Here, you want to have a small trotter error that is a small time step error. So you make the time step small enough so the acceptance probability is close to one. That, that gives you a small um, time step error. And so this is a way of monitoring how bad uh, your time step error is. And usually we run, I used to say we run at 99% acceptance probability. But now what people do is actually they do a lot better than that, 99.9. .9. It all depends on the accuracy that you want. But this gives you, by doing the acceptor, basically what it does is there, there are some places in configuration space where the trotter breakup is really bad. 
like near a nucleus or near a node, like uh, Ron was mentioning, uh, it may be really bad. And you make some bad decisions, right? Your, your drift is, is not constant in those regions. Your branching is not constant. You know, you have the wave function changes rapidly or something. In this case, you'll reject those steps and you'll do something more sensible in those parts of phase space. And um, if, if your rejection is something like, you know, 20% rejection rate, that means your time step is really too, too large. You know, that means like 20% of the time you're really making some bad moves and, you know, you have a large error. So that's the idea of this. But if you just eliminate this step right here, then you have a much larger time step error. This fixes most of the time step errors. Because the time step errors, if you had an exact wave function, you would have no time step errors at any time step. So this makes the time step error to be a product of how small tau is and times how uh, bad your trial wave function is. So you have a product thing going on there. So you get, you get like a much better uh, smaller time step error. Yeah, Quan. You mean, uh, I think the question is whether this rejection step um, guarantees the up, keeps the upper bound property. And the question, I guess, is whether the time step error is always positive. And I don't think it is always positive. I don't know of any result like that. The time, and so we're only going to get the upper bound property when we extrapolate to zero time step. So I, I don't think we can say that the time step error has any definite sign. So you always want, in diffusion Monte Carlo, you want to be sure that you have small enough time steps. Yeah? Can you go back to the previous slide I had a question about? So here, how is the P local calculated? Uh, I'm sorry, the question is how this local energy is calculated. It's just H psi over psi. Uh, trial wave function. So psi t. Psi t. So then the sampling is over phi times psi t. Right. That's what f is. It's phi right. times psi t. Right. That's right. Okay. That's what we're going to call the mixed distribution. Well, I think I already said that. So anyway, this is another algorithm thing. You can look in the notes to go through this carefully, but basically, you know, this is a Markov process. You initialize the state. Now the state would consist of a number of walkers, population, thousand walkers or whatever, that's the state. Okay, we have, um, you know, you calculate some properties of those random walks. And of course you want to, you initialize them actually from variational Monte Carlo. That's how you use our walkers, right? You, you do a variational Monte Carlo and you dump out a bunch of walkers and that's, that's your state. Okay, now we have these loops. Okay, and these are just like variational Monte Carlo. Uh, we sample a new uh, a step, but now it's a drifted Gaussian. Okay, and we calculate the new trial function, and this is gonna be the fixed node part that I haven't described yet, but anyway, this kills off walkers, um, but, uh, and if, if you don't kill them off, um, we evaluate this acceptance probability, just like in variational Monte Carlo, and we decide whether to take the moves or throw them out. And now here we do the branching. Uh, I don't know what happened with that star there, but anyway, uh, here is the local energy of their walker, and this is the branching factor, and uh, you know, Actually, you know, you reweight the, the walkers, you know, you kill them off or whatever, and that's the loop. You go through all the walkers. So this, the walkers can be done in, on different processors. Um, okay. What time is it now here? So let's see. Um, I'll go on for another 10 minutes or so and then stop. Um, so... There is a big problem of mixed estimators, and this is what you're 
uh, hinting at about properties. Uh, the diffusion Monte Carlo, uh, it was, so far we're still sticking with uh, bosons, if you liked, uh, but uh, even for bosons, you have this problem. Uh, to calculate energies, you're getting energies exactly correct because uh, their, their properties of the Hamilton, the energy is, you know, the expectation of the Hamiltonian, and because your dynamics are controlled by the Hamiltonian, you, you have no bias on the energy. But uh, this projector Monte Carlo samples the wrong distribution. And by that, I mean it's sampling the trial wave function times the um, exact ground state wave function. This is called the mixed distribution. Now, there are two other distributions. Uh, there's the variational Monte Carlo distribution, namely psi squared, trial wave function squared. And you have the correct distribution, which is phi squared. So the mixed distribution is sort of halfway in between the, these two distributions. And in fact, the, uh, the uh, common procedure is called linear extrapolation. Uh, which is you calculate observables in variational Monte Carlo and observables with this mixed distribution in diffusion Monte Carlo and you use that to correct it. And this is, gives you second order correct uh, uh, estimators. Uh, and you, know, you could do this procedure or that procedure there, uh, depending on whether you're dealing with a positive quantity or a, a quantity that can be positive and negative. Um, there's other solutions to this, um, uh, an, a nice thing to do is what's called a maximum overlap criteria. You know, the overlap uh, is this integral right here. And you could try to maximize this integral here, and that's called the, the maximum overlap criteria. And for a property, that means that the mixed estimator has to be the same as the variational estimator. So let's, let me give you an example. Suppose you're talking about the electric the density of particles. Suppose you have a, like a hydrogen atom and you, you can have the electron density of the hydrogen atom, right? And the density is a, you know, an observable. Um, you can calculate the electron density, variational Monte Carlo and diffusion Monte Carlo. If you get different values for the electron density, you're not, you don't have the optimal wave function. What you want to do is try to adjust the trial wave function so the electron density mixed equals variational. And that means that this is minimized with respect to A, and in a certain sense, you know, this first order term vanishes and probably the higher order terms are smaller. So that's the maximum overlap method. Very rarely used, I should say, but uh, it, theoretically a nice method. Forward walking is a, is a, a, a better procedure, um, and this was introduced by Kalos also. And the idea is that we, we figure out what the descendants of a given walker are. And so P of R0 is the population resulting from a single walker after a time T. Okay, and that's given, this is, remember, the Green's function. And if we expand in terms of excited states, we see that the limit at large time is given by the ratio of the trial wave function, of the exact wave function to the trial function times a, 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 a constant that doesn't depend on R0. So basically, this is why it's called forward walking. I suppose you want to calculate the electron density. You, calc you, you, how do you calculate electron density? Well, you look where the electrons are, and you make a histogram. If the electron is at this position, you put one in the histogram, right? Okay, with forward walking, you don't put a one in there. You put that aside, and you do a few more iterations of your random walk, and they're branching. And you found out that that configuration, 10 generations later, turned into, say, four random walks. Instead of putting one in the distribution, you put four in there. So like, uh, like your parents, how many grandchildren did they have? If they have 10 grandchildren, they get to count 10 in the observables. If they only had zero grandchildren, they don't count at all in the observables. That's the idea of forward walking. You see it's kind of a, 
uh, complicated because it's, it's not exactly a, Mark, a Markov chain. You think you do everything with a random walk now. You have a calculated observables, and then you move on. Here, you have to remember something of the past and to weight it. And that's the idea. Now, the trouble is that is this limit. T goes to infinity. So if the thing, if your observable converges fast in time, then it works well. But if it takes a long time, these fluctuations in population lead to an inefficiency. It becomes slower and slower to converge. OK. So we're going to have a better solution after the break when, when I talk about <laughs> money turtle. Anyway, this is what forward walking is. Here's an example I did a long time ago. Um, fusion sticking. This is a non-electronic structure. Well, there's a few people that are not in electronic <laughs> condensed matter. Um, this is a, it's like cold fusion, but this is actually before cold fusion. Um, uh, if you put a muon in liquid hydrogen, it causes a lot of nuclear reactions. And the question is how many it does and what happens to the muon afterwards. And so what we wanted to calculate is the wave function. We have three particles. We have a muon, the blue particle, and two um, uh, hydrogen nuclei. So we have a three-body problem. We may have an electron here, too. OK, maybe a four-body problem. And what you want to calculate is the w actual value of the wave function when these two particles are at the same location, because that's when fusion happens. And so what we did was forward walking. So I started the random walk out when these two particles are on top of each other, and then I let them diffuse out into the space, and I calculated how the population changed. So, well, you can't see this, this is 1.0 here. This, so it, they didn't change, and then they, they move outward, and you see it plateaus out, and this is the value of the wave function. And so it, yeah, I actually, you know, I started, say, I don't know how many, a million walkers here, and I followed it out, and I averaged them, and you can see you can get precise values for the mini-body wave function. And it, it's particularly difficult to get with usual methods. You might think a three-body problem like this would not be hard to do variationally. But the trouble is, this is at a singular place in phase space that is where the potential energy is infinite. And so it required some care to get this out. If you use a variational method that tries to minimize the energy, it doesn't care at all about this one singular place in, in many body phase space. OK. I'm going to have to do the sign problem after the break. I guess the food is out there, right? Um, the, um, there are other projector methods. This is diffusion Monte Carlo where we use this operator, the exponential operator. Green's function Monte Carlo that Kalos invented used this operator uh, uh, and it has, it's come back in recent years, uh, well, I'll talk about that. Uh, these two methods, you can get rid of all time step pairs. This one for the lattice is called Power Monte Carlo. And actually, this is work that I did with Nandini when, I was, uh, when she was here as a postdoc. And so you have, but it only works for a lattice model because you, you have to have a bounded spectrum that is bounded above and below in order for this to make sense. Um, and another type, the Green's function Monte Carlo, you can do these two things in the continuum, but both of these cases, you can actually get rid of all the time step errors. Uh, in fact, I mentioned that, that recent revival in, in dynamical mean field theory, which I think Ron is going to talk about, there's a Monte Carlo thing that's embedded inside the DMFT, and they use something that's called continuous time Monte Carlo, which is very similar to what Green's function Monte Carlo is that Kalos did with the hard spheres back in 1974. You can actually get rid of all the time, trot or break up. But that's what, um, what I learned back in the 80s is even if you get rid of all the time step errors, that doesn't mean it's more efficient than a method that has time step errors. Uh, so you, you, know, you have to, uh, that's only one feature 
of an algorithm is whether it has time step error. The other question is how efficient it is. Uh, okay, so let's stop there. Um, and any questions before the break? I'm going to talk about fermions, obviously, next. So, um, about the mixed estimator for the energy. Yes. If I understand correctly, only in the limit of t tends to infinity will the mixed estimator from the energy be uh, equal to the ground state energy. The, the ground state, not the energy. The energy does not have this bias of the mixed estimator. The energy, because the energy is the expectation of the Hamiltonian, and your, your, uh, the dynamics are with the Hamiltonian, has no bias. But any other operator that does not commute with the Hamiltonian will have a bias, could have a bias. So like the density or the potential energy or, or whatever, all those things don't commute with the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian is okay. Uh, but but my, my question was a finite term for, for fi when we estimating the energy using the mixed estimator expression, where yeah. uh, for finite time, that, estimate, that estimated energy can be below the exact ground state. The question is whether at finite time it could be below the ground state. Uh, no, it, can, it can't be. Uh, the energy generally speaking, comes down from above and, and plateaus out. I mean, I'll show you that, actually, when I talk about rotation. It, you know, if, if you start out with variational Monte Carlo, it'll come down above the exact ground state, an asymptote to the ground state. But there's a difference here. Um, when we're doing the diffusion Monte Carlo, we really can do an infinite number of steps. So, so imaginary time can become very, very large. And it's just a matter of running long. There's, uh, running longer. There's no stability issue of going to many, many iterations in diffusion Monte Carlo. When you do the uh, forward walking to fix the mixed estimator problem, you cannot go to very, very long times because the efficiency goes to zero at long times because you're carrying along these weights. And the problem is, I mean, I gave this analogy, you want to wait with the number of grandchildren or great-grandchildren or whatever, but you know that in the long time limit, a single person controls the whole population, if you think about it. And so eventually, your, your random walk gets less and less efficient the more the weights uh, uh, fluctuate, right? And the weights just keep fluctuating more and more as you go large. But you don't have that problem when you're calculating the energy. Oh, but in the expression, you have so you're getting, the, uh, you're getting the matrix element between psi h and phi t. Yes. Right. There is no reason why that matrix element should be bounded by the exact energy. That is just a matrix element between two arbitrary wave functions. Until unless one of no no one, one is the exact wave function. Yeah, and that's my point that you will only get that exact wave function in the limit of t tends to infinity for any finite value of t that is not the exact wave function. That's right. It depends on your initial conditions. I agree with you there. They, I, I think it does. But it, it, it's true that, um, actually, I can prove it. Suppose that, suppose that we start our initial conditions um, um, are, are the, the ground state, okay? I mean, sorry, the travel wave function. What we're calculating is e to the minus ht times psi t, and then we have a Hamiltonian, and then we have psi t, right? right? Um, you can think about a wave function, um, psi t of t, as being e to the minus h, I'll put a t over 2 there, times the trial wave function. The variational theorem applies to this object so that the energy of this object, that is h psi t of t times psi t of t, must be greater than uh, the ground state energy. Right. So we always have to come down from above 
So as a function of iterations t, this is the ground state. This is the variational energy here. We always come down like that. Right. right. I, so, I completely agree with that. But on the top expression, you do not have exponential minus i t. So the bra and the kit vectors are different. No, they're not different. <coughs> this was the initial condition. And this is, we apply h this way. So it is symmetric in that sense. So I think this applies. If, but that, assuming you start out populating your walkers from the trial wave function, you could start out populating your walkers from some other distribution, and you could be below here. But as long as you start out t equals 0 at the variational wave function, it has to come down like this. Not, OK. Any other questions? OK. Produced by OCE Atlas Digital Media at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign.